and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the temple, coming to us straight from Solar Studios, creators of Red Sky and its 5th edition conversion. In the red corner, we, ha we have the, the man of a thousand syllables, Alex. <laughs> God damn, wait, I screwed it up again. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We have, we may have to do it again because this is Tyler. Yeah, Brandon and Tyler. Yeah, Alex Br is uh, not around. God damn. Did I throw it all up? Uh, did I break the whole thing? Yes, you did, and you should feel ashamed <laughs> for it. <laughs> I won't tell anybody. <laughs> I can be Alex. Frankly, I've always been curious. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we have we have Brandon and Ty we have Brandon and Tyler straight from Solar Studios. How how are we doing today, guys? After my complete fail with trying to be a trying to be a bad Bruce Buffer impression, <laughs> or oh, man, actually no. Michael Buffer. Sorry. I mean, I thought your impression was fantastic, and mm -hmm. we're doing pretty good. Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, I'm Brandon. Um, I'm the CEO of Solar Studios, and I, um, you know, am also one of the lead designers for the game in terms mm -hmm. of mechanics. Uh, I also do all the technological work, you know, website development and any software development we need at Solar Studios. Mm -hmm. So, it's uh, true. Oh, go Sorry. ahead. Sorry. Um, I, I thought Tyler could introduce himself, too. For sure. So, I'm um, Tyler. I am the lead writer and content manager for Solar Studios. This whole world ship worth of stuff set off when I started the idea for Red Sky with Alex, who, you know, I will embody as two people, <laughs> um, back in college, you know, trying to figure out what would be the coolest thing to see. Mm -hmm. And I'm we got Brandon on board, and it's just been a whole wonderful journey since then. So yeah, yeah. they like showed up with so, like uh, th there was a different project that they were working on um, involving uh, you know some other stuff, and I showed up and I was like, wow, this is like deep lore that you guys have. How long have you been working on this? And they told me about it, and as they you know described it i i kind of decided that i wanted in on the project and that was kind of the impetus for us to start a company mm -hmm. so is on the agenda mildra yeah yeah so i um i like to open with the humble beginnings in a sense so i, I want both of you to walk me through your introductions to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick um well, I guess I can go first. Um, as So a lot of people get started with the role-playing games when they're really young by friends and family. I didn't get into it until college. Um, you know, I was uh, going to Rutgers University, and uh, just one of the random new people that I met in my dormitory was like, have you ever played Dungeons & Dragons? I had, of course, heard of it, but no, I had never had. And so um, they they ran for me, and three like five of my other friends um, this grand three point five uh, game, in like this homebrew world that they made themselves, and I was honestly flabbergasted by the amount of possibilities available. Um, you know, I made my own character. I, of course, did the thing that many first-time players do, where I was like, oh, my character is the most special one and, and gets to be the hero. And then, oh, but what, what I really liked is that um, I would devour the player's handbook, and I was always, like, learning the rules um, and, like, looking at the different things to do. Um, and anybody who's played 3.5 knows that there is no end to that. <laughs> It was a bit much, but it was also like hugely entertaining, and and I loved it. After that campaign came to an end, um, that was right around the time that fifth edition was coming out. Mm -hmm. So as soon as fifth edition dropped, I was all over it, and I started by DMing fifth edition. Like it was like I I was DMing it before I had even played a game in it. 
Um, and, you know, I used all that 3.5, like, era rules had really prepped me to digest the simplicity that is 5e mm-hmm. really fast. And so I got the hang of it, and I've been kind of the guy that runs games for, or one of the, the few guys that runs games for our friend group ever since. Um, Tyler was actually one of my games. So, I, Tyler, was that your first game? Why don't you talk about your experience? Yeah, so... I mean, working backwards is just a general child of, like, the 2000s. Like, the video games I would play were, you know, as far as RPGs go, like, hey, strength, intelligence, charisma, stamina. And I'm like, huh, this seems to be a recurring kind of thing. I wonder where they all got the same notes from. And then when I got to college... to the old republic, right? Yeah. <laughs> Where's where's the granddad? It's D and D. But mm-hmm. to go into it as somebody who didn't have that up like origins to it, mm-hmm. and still kind of immediately know where things intuitively are like coming from, um, I just joined Brandon's campaign. I was like, this is cool. I'm a dwarf sailor. I can basically say anything, and it vibes within this campaign. Um, And that just kind of got me hooked on the whole idea of like, yeah, tabletop is going to remain this just vibrant space, not only for gaming, but like creativity. Because Brandon's world that he ran a couple campaigns in was just so rich and realized. By the time a couple years out of college, we decided we wanted to do a 5e book. It was like, okay, the natural vehicle um, for Red Sky is to just give, give everybody the tools to kind of go out and do their own sort of exploring through a world we came up with. Mm -hmm. So it's been cool. It's totally kind of out of left field that I picked up the hobby this late, but I'm happy to be a late bloomer because it's introduced me to like really cool people to try and do something like this with. Yeah. Um, there are there are some there are some people who try and have a very specific divide between between old school and new school depending on where you got where you got this where you got your start. Um, that sort of that sort of thinking is com- is completely discouraged here in the temple. Um, I there is there is no there is no old school there is no new school there is ju- there is just well the way if you if you'll permit me to make a Star Wars joke. <laughs> this is the way. <laughs> um, and actually, actually, I can get away with it because this is the May. <laughs> um, but since you since you mentioned just just going through de- just going through these very detailed worlds with the campaigns that you um that you had set up, is that the origin story when it came to Red Sky of of you guys just um just shoot just. Just um, bre- just breeze shooting and brainstorming ideas for ideas for a for a setting. Um, I'll let Tyler handle the origin of Red Sky, but like my campaign was different. It was actually kind of Forgotten Realms cosmology, just based in a custom landmass with custom politics and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I'm happy that it inspired Tyler to be like, "Wow, like world building is a really cool thing." But then, like, he and Alex actually conceived Red Sky without me. So I'll let him cover how that came about. I mean, there's just a general sense when you run into people who like science fiction and fantasy anything that there's this kind of, like, rich tradition that you could build off of Mm -hmm. if you wanted to do anything creative. And just kind of knowing all the things we enjoyed growing up, whether it was, like, you know, the old school, I shouldn't say old school, whether it was like the foundational games in the canon or the latest like Mass Effect or Dragon Age game. um, What stuck out to us was how that feeling when you're going through about the fifth codex entry and you realize, wait a minute, I've spent more time reading about this town than walking through it Mm -hmm. so far, but in a good way. Um, So we had a couple ideas for kind of games that could be in this space. And it really just came down to if we were going to create something that would appeal to not only other people with similar tastes, but like would have sucked us in circa 14 years old, 15 years old, what would that look like? And we love dragons. We love lasers. Happy medium is when your dragons are genetically modified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, 
you've described Red Sky as a science fantasy campaign setting. And yes. a term like science, if you'll forgive me for making a fishing reference, a term like science fantasy is casting a very large net. Because for one, a lot a lot of people look a lot of people look at science fantasy and they t and they typically think in terms of um, Star Wars, which personally I don't think I don't think is completely fair. Sim simply because of the fact that well, for one, Star Wars leans more towards space opera, and two, um, it can it kind of it kind of bottlenecks what you can do with um, the idea of with the idea of science fantasy. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, like, oh, continue your question. Sorry. So what what I'm curious about is what is what sort what sort of what sort of styling of science fantasy are you guys shooting for with Red Sky, and what would you say are some of your um, inspirations towards that? I think it really comes down to trying to be as accessible to the imagination when it comes to science fantasy, where there was something that wasn't going to do it with hard uh, SF or something with high fantasy. And you want to have this kind of like melding um, of the best types of like adventures mm -hmm. and stuff. So the influences were about as wide as like, you know, Mad Max for this one area of the world where like people race land ships across mm -hmm. a desert. Um, all the way through to, you know, the deepest parts of the Silmarillion on Brandon's end, when we would mm -hmm. talk about, well, what would the religious structure of, you know, the hegemony be when it comes to all sorts of ways that we could play with the genres? So I feel like it is a wide net, um, but you get the choice of a number of fish when you're making your sushi mm -hmm. and the best bits can wind up on the table. Yeah, and there, there there's an element of... Um... Like in Mad Max, or like, um, like it, even the properties like Star Trek or something, they they are they, it's science fiction there, or not Mad Max, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's no true magic in what's going on. That doesn't stop you from being invested in it. But then there is an aspect of fantasy that is, you know, exploring and identifying the unknown. Mm -hmm. So Red Sky kind of brings things together in a way where it's uh, meant to be there. There is an ancient technology here, a trip that a lot of, you know, other properties use the ancient civilization and stuff. Um, but this is not a magical world. But as a player, um, as, a, as somebody who is in the game, it might as well be because of the things that you can find and and like the mysticism of the world you know there are ruins that just aren't explained how did this come to be there are there are artifacts that you can collect that just let you do things that are completely unthinkable um and you know that that's a kind of mystic energy that we wanted to capture even though we didn't want to go with a hard magic system route with mm -hmm. this with this property now when it comes one thing, one thing that I noticed, <clears throat> apart from apart from some other um, some other campaign settings that I've that I've seen, is that there isn't necessarily a fo a um, a focal a a kind of focal point sort of sort of background with because with some with some campaign settings you definitely have that, and I'm guessing in your case you wanted to go for the widest. Um, group of possibilities for whatever um, type of campaign that the play that the table would want to use it for um, that's right um, there we plan to meet, be covering a lot of this world mm -hmm. like as much it, obviously we can't get to everything given the space constraints of the book um, but there there's gonna be a lot of detail about a lot of different things however um, I'll let Tyler go into some more detail about this. There is a conflict in the world that is very central to what is going on. Mm -hmm. And that is the human hegemony versus uh, the Night Riders. Uh, so, yeah. Tyler, you think you can drop a summary of how that, uh, that conflict shakes down? 
Oh, definitely, because this plays into Mildred's idea of like what makes a genre a genre. I think you two have also noticed that when it comes to many high fantasy stories, you have this like kingdom of goodness and light and ways that the story is told through their adventures that seem to point to like they're obviously the good guy. The solar hegemony in Red Sky is if all of those tropes were inverted. Their ideology is very much we are setting out to rid the world of evil, but it's the case that the people they consider evil are just another thinking civilization. There are different cultural contexts here because the Knight Riders are these nomadic people who live on the dark half of the world of Dema. But you have this sort of very textured way of going through, you know, decades of the game's lore because we have four different eras and you can basically see how this conflict plays out where, you know, thousands and thousands of stories are probably being told through the course of this multi-war sort of conflict between the good guys who are very much all about, you know, inflicting their will or their idea of what is right um and the bad guys in the night riders who once you dive into their culture it's more of a nuanced like hey we were moving because of like you know resource scarcity this isn't necessarily because we have a villain who lives in a volcano you know passing out rings mm -hmm. <laughs> real su real subtle there <laughs> <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with Tolkien he is he is the foundation yeah but when it one of the one of the key things that I saw that I saw get brought up a lot in, my, in when I was doing my own research on Red Sky is that of Elder Tech. Um, what I'm curious about with the idea of Elder Tech is in what ways would it be similar and what ways would it be different to how people look at magic items? Yeah. So. In the sense that Elder Tech is our answer to a magicless setting, there are certain things it can do that are functionally identical to magic, and there are hard stops on what it can't do. If you want to throw a fireball, presumably you can find an Elder Tech gauntlet that has some plasma built into it, and you make a cool fireball. If you want to turn back time, or raise the dead, or do anything beyond this yeah. set of constraints yeah it's a different story in the sense that you know that there are storytelling potential bits with elder tech but you also know that this is grounded in something that can't appeal to a wider uh mysticism yeah. in how the world even, works even even bringing up magic items makes me want to go grab my dm's guide uh <laughs> yes yeah, yeah, it's just it's just like <clears throat> yeah the, the function, as Tyler is right, they are functionally equivalent to magic items. And as for the world's purpose, they are the only source of magic that is beyond what, like, the, the characters of the world could reasonably explain. Mm -hmm. um, and so you won't get a wish spell out of these things, but there's going to be a lot you can do. Like, because it, we're also talking about, you know, a, a world ship that is flying through space at, like, who even knows how fast. And the world ship can host a false sun and, like, restructure this land as they please. Who knows the limits of that kind of technology? It's it's beyond our comprehension. And so a lot of the, um, the setup of the Elder Tech is that... Um, some of it is left there by, you know, previous what we call cycles, where the uh, overseers are testing the people uh, or the species that are inside of the, the landmass of Dema. And some of it is put there deliberately by the overseers uh, to – because when, you know, the idea is to, like, seed these species across the galaxy, and they want to see how they will – there and in the event of a catastrophic event where they might only have relics of what they were left with mm -hmm. um you know so it's it's a, like you know in in game it's just because we want to have magic items but there is a good reason for like them tampering with the ex the overseers tampering with the experiment so to speak by leaving these items scattered across the world 
I, get, I, can, I can certainly get behind that. Now, when it comes now when it comes to so when it comes to some of the things um, added, um, I'll start I'll start with the I'll start with the relative easy parts before we before we dive into the crunchy bits. Um, mm -hmm. Now you you've talked in the on the page it talks about you guys having six um, species, and what I'm curious about with e with each of them is I'd is what what can you t what can you tell me about what each of them is going to be bringing to the t going to be bringing to the proverbial table and um how di how different um humans are in this particular setting um the human problem uh is something that we're still working on a little bit because it is it is hard to separate the humans from just like the baseline and make mm -hmm. them unique um but we have some ideas in the works that uh, are still being play tested. As for the other species, um, the general idea is um, there's a bit of a design philosophy, um, you know, that me and the other main designer Ken have agreed upon, and that is uh, we are not trying to make these species the most balanced additions to D and D that you have seen. Uh, we want to make it so that they have real meaningful impacts on your play experience mm -hmm. and constrain any balances so that it's not ruining the game for the other people in your party. So, for example, um, the Wake Walker, uh, the big amphibious species, not semi-amphibious, not truly amphibious, right, Tyler? Yeah. Um, so... Uh, they are the largest species. They're like over six and a half feet tall. They're bigger than you, Mildra. So, <laughs> um, and they are beefy. And by nature, they are just going to be the strongest baseline species, period. That's just how it is in this world. And um, we, you know, they're, but that doesn't mean that they can't go like other species can't go toe to toe with them in a fight and still not come out on top. You know, you just have to kind of think smarter. Um, a feather folk, for example, um, you know, one of our bird people, as they're called, they uh, are going to have particular weaknesses. In one, they their bones are less dense. Um, they're actually vulnerable to bludgeoning damage just by default, which is a huge disadvantage and something that can, in fact, be mitigated with certain types of armor. Um, but it's like, you know, between a feather folk and a, and a wake walker loose in in a stadium with each other mm -hmm. um each with a hammer the the wake walker is going to come out on top and that's just the end of it um but you know given an agility contest or like you know given perhaps a more dexterous weapon the feather folk may have a huge advantage uh and the way that it, it, it that is part of the design philosophy of uh, every one of these species is we want to make it so that it can lean into its strengths in a way that allow it to be effective um, in many different ways. Uh, but, you know, not necessarily try to flatten everything out so that it's like, you know, completely balanced. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I know it's kind of a hot take for like design choice, but that's what we are going with. All right. The lore has been informed very much by those game design choices. Uh, to pull one of the 20 cultures from a hat, the Cairn Keepers, which are a tribe of Night Riders, basically live in like a winter wasteland. They are by law required to send out their children when they come of age into the Tenebrae, which is where, you know, woolly mammoths and yetis and ice spiders that weave webs that can cut your skin are just kind of hanging out there. A character with the origin of a Cairn Keeper would probably have a lot more compelling reasons to be an effective hunter if that was their childhood versus somebody who lives on the tropical side of the planet who decided one day, yeah, you know, I seem to be able to <laughs> plink womp rats, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. So we're hoping that they work in tandem with each other. Yeah. And also, I just want to mention, um, you know, so that the listeners don't get the wrong idea. Um, another part of Red Sky is that we are um, planning to 
allow uh, in the current design there are other ways to get ability score increases at character creation besides the species that you choose so it's not like locked into like if you want to play a fighter you have to pick a wake walker um we're making sure that we have other ways to be an effective member of a particular class no matter what species you have chosen uh and you know part of that is by the you, you the there are still ability score increases for the species but there are also other ability score increases that come with what is called the element which you know we can get into later mm -hmm. yeah as big fans of the website tv tropes it's like know your tropes and then subvert as many of them as would be cool and then give everybody the tools to surprise you with what they come up with yeah yeah. Now, since since you dropped since you dropped a hint at that, I may as I may as well make sure that Chekhov's gun hasn't jammed. Um, <laughs> I'd like you to I'd like you to 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 talk to me about the elemental dualism um, setup you have with alignment, because I get because it's definitely what I find interesting about this is that it's it's that it's far more integrated with the sandbox that is Red Sky than the typical nine alignment system is. Thank goodness I've always had my issues with the nine alignment system. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so Brandon can tell you mechanically how this is going to help you design a character perfectly suited to either your personality or the personality you want to roleplay as. Mm -hmm. The elemental dualism, or the elements, is basically woven into the world, uh, lore-wise and mechanically. So you have these three spectrums that you can kind of gauge a person's personality or an organization's features on. Um, the interesting thing about the first one, which is the emotional spectrum, is that fire, the element of passion and ambition and you know pursuing goals with everything you have, is contrasted with water in the sense that that's like self-discipline and restraint and careful planning. But as opposed to thinking by nature, all fire characters would have to be like the villains because they want to take over the world or all water characters would have to be like Jedi or monks or elves. It's not tied like the D and D alignments are with the nine versions um, to morality. You could be, a noble fire character you could be a dystopianly oppressive water character mm -hmm. that interplay carries through the air and the earth which is the intellectual spectrum where you have to balance creativity versus being systematic mm -hmm. um and the moral spectrum or the social spectrum which is do you value freedom and merit at the cost of potentially ushering chaos through not having structure or do you value compassion and unity at the cost of potentially being oppressive? Mm -hmm. So all of this, when you are able to craft a character or an organization in Red Sky, is hopefully going to give you every bit of context you need to come up with the exact kind of roleplay experience you want to see in the world. Yeah, and I'm I'm guessing I'm guessing that it's it's not a case. I'm guessing that it's not a case where where you where it has to be completely balanced between the two, between the two extremes whether whether that be uh, whether that be on a scale setup or other or otherwise it's more of how much more how much less of each that you have um no it's not a meter type system um it's simpler than that um it's it, because uh, yeah you you are right that uh each end of each spectrum is extreme um, and most people fall somewhere in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so the the way that that's expressed is we don't do the meter thing. We don't do, oh, you're like, um, out of a scale of 10 with zero being water and 10 being fire, you're at seven. Like, that's that's not how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. It's either, it, it's simply you evaluate the character that you're building and you see... Um, whether they are, uh, you know, closer to one spectrum or another. Just that's it. Um, just whether they uh, have to, like, you know, whether you would say they edge on the side of fire, edge on the side of earth, and then edge on the side of aether. 
on this spectrum. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is space for neutrality in that that we're working on as well. But when it comes to your character choices, um, each of those elements that you chose on each of the spectrums has particular ability scores and like a mechanical element, like an ability that goes with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And from the ones that fit your character, you can... If you know you say my personality is is fire earth aether, you can pick um, from among the fire earth aether one ability score increase and one feature that is going to enhance your build. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there like it, that way you have a multitude of choices, um, and you still have what well, you come out of it with good role. What we consider to be like good role play guidelines. Like, my character, when it comes to a situation, is going to trust their instincts and live in the moment because they're a fire character. A water character, by contrast, would need time to think about it, press down their emotions, and try to think through it logically. You know, like, a fire character is going to be like, this is what I think it's right, that's what I'm going to go with. Mm -hmm. And it's so it's meant to be equal parts feature and gameplay enhancement and roleplay guideline. Okay. Also, a very fun drinking game. <laughs> um, if you sit around with a couple friends and look at your favorite pop culture and say, what would be the three of the six elements of, I don't know, the dwarves in Tolkien? I had a five minute back and forth with a friend where I was saying, oh, no, they're Earth because their culture is very much proud tradition and systematic. And my friend was like, well, no, they're air because they are a culture um facing all of these social changes and they have to adapt the tradition or i've argued that they were water because they have this structure to design their society around you know a very um relaxed state of like gradual progress and then i think brandon turned around and said well then how do you explain thorin taking like 12 guys and trying to you know rob the dragon that's pretty yeah. fire thing to do yeah um so, yeah, people, uh, organizations, you can apply this not only all throughout Red Sky, but it's also just a fun kind of like social system for other topics. Which, um, be very be very careful bringing that up with me because I may end up using that as an episode for my podcast where I just go, <laughs> where I just go through different characters and what their alignments might be. And if I go down that rabbit hole, um, I'm not coming back. <laughs> there, there, there have been hours of conversations among the Red Sky staff about like, like there have been like mentions of characters and articles that have gone back to the editing board because it's like, wait, no, 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 this character is not those elements. <laughs> it's a thing. Yeah, or a fire character like I don't know Daenerys in Game of Thrones does a very water choice when she's running the city, and you think, is she water now, or was that playing against the personality and decisions we've seen? Like it's yeah. it's a it's more than a rabbit hole. It's like one of those uh, prairie dogs where they build a tunnel network. Yeah, <laughs> but when you're when you're building your own character, it's easier. Mm. And it, it I I have found in the characters that I've built using the system that it makes sense and it really helps get your character's personality off the ground from like the first session it's it's pretty helpful yeah i mean i i um i can't say that as i could i could definitely see myself using using that for for um uh, for other for other approaches especially any game that that i run that involves heavy um heavy faction based play which it does seem that red sky does ha- does have a bit does have a bit of that in it yeah um yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to classes, um, I definitely see some familiar some familiar names and some and some less familiar names. Now, it now I think it's state I think it's stated within this that Red Sky has si- has six classes for the, for its particular setup. Um, when even w- even with that, do you do you plan on having a sidebar to give advice about what um what not what non-standard or third-party classes would be good or bad ideas? Obviously, you can't go through all of them, but ju- but more of a guideline thing. Actually, we've already brought that up, and uh, somebody asked a very similar question to me just the other day, and. Mm. Um, whether, you know, how adaptable they would be. And my answer to that is that um, they are going to 
generally be pretty adaptable to other systems and other third party stuff without um magic is going to fit very well into red sky Mm -hmm. like everything like for example in classic um D, you know the the vanilla dnd the the fighter and the wizard can exist in the same party and the fighter is not outclassed now i think that if you brought a wizard into the red sky world i think that the classes that we have would be outclassed simply because nothing else in the world can compete with the magic that the wizard is wielding Mm -hmm. like you know it makes the wizard becomes a lot more powerful when there's no other wizards around so um (laughs) although the tables could absolutely be leveled given if the fighter like for example has some elder tech to assist him yeah um the uh the as as we're doing things right now, um, the 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 game is generally going to be geared toward more low level and dangerous play. Um, get it out there right now. In this system, in this adaptation of Five E, the levels only go up to ten, and that is deliberate. Um, you know, it's not because we got to you know twenty and gotten like you know tired of it. Um, at the times that I have played at high levels in my 5e games, it's because I wanted to be like some kind of reality warping magical being or like mm-hmm. that has been able to just cause destruction and like really solve problems by taking a hammer to them. Yeah. Um, and Red Sky is not meant to be that kind of game. It's meant to be kind of characters that really have to plan out their approaches to problems. If the dragon pops up, you better have a strategy that is different than just going up and whacking it in the face because you're going to get eaten. Mm-hmm. Like that's just how the game is is, is designed. Um, so uh, I would tell people to keep that in mind when they are porting third party classes to this world or porting these these um, classes to a different world. Um, they should work fine if you're doing low level play and as long as the like you don't bring a random like 10th level wizard into like a into this world with into like a bunch of party uh, with party levels that are like fifth level non magical people mm-hmm. that would be a bad idea um now with now when it comes to the six classes that you're introducing um one thing, one thing that I'm, one thing that I'm, that I'm curious of is, are the, are the, how, I'd like to go down each of them and and see how similar or different they would be to more core classes, and I'll start at the top with the fighter. So, um, the fighter is. Hang on, let me bring up my, uh, um, my reference because I wrote the fighter a long time ago. Um, so the fighter, for example, is going to be very structurally similar to the 5th edition fighter as it exists in vanilla 5e. There are some differences. Some things are shuffled around a little bit, and we're still playtesting all of this stuff. So it gets, like, uh, you know, things might still change on this. But here's an example. Um Yes, uh, there's. Uh, I believe that the fighter gets, like, for example, the extra attack is normally granted at level 11. In vanilla 5e, we grant it at level 10 because we only go up to 10. Mm-hmm. I also think that Indomitable comes at a later, later, or it comes at an earlier level than it does in vanilla 5e because, you know, it's just. It, a fighter essentially has some abilities shuffled around. But yeah, like, Indomitable. Yeah, we make that available, I think, with two uses at level 9. Um, and it only has one use in 5th edition. So you will see minor tweaks like that to the fighter and the rogue. The main change between what is going on with them and Vanilla 5e is that we are adding an additional subclass to these. Um, actually, I think we're adding two additional subclasses to the fighter um, that are meant to interact more socially um, with because there's going to be a lot of social elements in Red Sky. So the subclass is going to be, for the fighter, one of them is the Bounty Hunter. Mm -hmm. Um, And because of, you know, they they are kind of a... They have interesting hunting abilities, given that, you know, that augments... They almost become like like the hunter is to animals, but for people. Um, 
And because they are all used to negotiating, they actually get some buffs to, you know, intimidation and charisma checks. Like when they're trying to haggle for coin or haggle over bounties or convince somebody to back down or come in without a fight. Um, like that's the angle that we're going to mm -hmm. for familiarity with some augmentation to fit the world a little better better with those two classes. All right. Now when it, now next is the sage which um I don't I don't re I don't recall the, the, as far as I'm aware there isn't a there isn't a sage there isn't a sage class um but I get the feeling that sage is a very skill monkey class. Um I would actually say that you may be a little bit off there. Um, the sage is actually meant to be um, an intelligence-based medicine man or shaman that is, you know, like in a lot of fantasy you see, you will have like the one witch doctor or whatever that lives in the middle of the village mm -hmm. or wherever, and they have a bunch of remedies and poultices and they help take care of people that are brought to them. So um, it, it, the sage is typically going to perform that kind of function. There is not a lot of true healing in Red Sky because of the nature of it being a non-magical world and it being a dangerous, more dangerous kind of game. Mm -hmm. However, there is some limited amount of healing, and also poultices can do things like remove poisons, um, like enhance your strength or, or, or constitution for a period of time. Um, and perform that kind of function. So it's meant to be a heavy support class that is going to have a, a background of intelligence that to, to fall back on and mm -hmm. is meant to be like kind of a, a thoughtful kind of character. All right. Um, There's also the opportunity for sages to dive into elder tech study, mm -hmm. which would give them certain benefits based off of understanding what kind of artifacts that they get their hands on. So yeah, you that, might have an that's instance. That's a great point, Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. You might have an instance where you're dungeon diving and you come up to a dais with this jar of orange liquid on it, and you take a sip, and the elder tech nanites inside like fix that limp you've had your whole life. You're gonna say, "Wow, this might be something worth pursuing as a man of medicine <laughs> or science." <laughs> yeah. Also, they can make poisons and throw them in bottles because who doesn't like doing that? Yeah, fair fair point. I I technically prefer throwing around alchemist fire, but that's just me. <laughs> well, alchemist fire is a thing too. Yeah, for sure. Because all of it, if because if because um if fire doesn't work, use more fire. Absolutely, fire that won't <laughs> go out when you step on it. Well, what? Well, that's what that's why Greek fire exists. Yeah, uh, terrifying Greek fire. Mm -hmm. Oh. Those poor people who must have seen it for the first time. Yeah. Um, so next is Hunter, and I'm guessing that I'm guessing that's analogous to the Ranger. Well, you bet. Um, th there are some changes that we are still making with the Hunter. In fact, it's the the, the pure mechanics of what's going on with the Hunter are kind of a hotly debated topic right now. Uh, me and Ken have uh, several ideas that we're, uh, that we've cooked up and we are trying to make sure that all the subclasses are balanced with each other. Well, mm -hmm. um, it's going, it, it's been a fun time. We've had to, um, we have more ideas than we know what to do with, with this one. And we're going to make sure that it's pared down and delivered in a really good package. Um, but one, one thing that we're working on um, that we're really excited about is a more, structured system of traps that exists in current vanilla 5e that mm -hmm. um the hunter can really take full advantage of um you know like i have a nail and a trip wire let's let's do some stuff you know and uh, they can set up all kinds of like spring traps um uh web fall traps uh, like a whole bunch of stuff that we we're building out and you know providing some guidelines for mm. as a subclass and then um uh, but as you can expect it's meant to kind of bring the ranger to life in a way without magic so the hunter is meant to be a pretty strong performer um like a striker similar to the fighter mm -hmm. uh and there are certain things that we've done such as make uh hunter's mark which is you know the kind of necessary spell that every ranger kind of has to have yeah it's the kind of thing that it, it, technically you need magic for it, mm -hmm. but that spell 
can exist in a like mentally without magic Mm -hmm. it's something that you know there's certain things like that that you know can conceivably exist in a world even though magic doesn't exist and so like the the hunter still has hunter's mark we haven't taken that away from them in fact they have an augmented version of hunter's mark that is meant to be more easily transferable and play into tracking a little bit more Mm -hmm. so it's an interesting one and it's been fun to work on is one subclass I hope makes through the chopping block, which is Big Game Hunter, because I think one of the clans of Wake Walkers falls under that umbrella. They got their hands on these Elder Tech diving suits that let them withstand enormous amounts of pressure and stay underwater and be maneuverable. But the entire area of that world called the Midnight Isles is infested with Deep Ones. And the rule of a Deep One is that A Deep One has eaten more Wake Walkers than the other way around. And the Wake Walkers think that's a challenge. So the most common way to take down a Deep One that is as large as an island, except islands don't have scales, is to intentionally get swallowed by it and get to its heart. Mm -hmm. Because a big game hunter can take down what it's hunting from the inside out. I I gotcha. Now, next is Wordsmith. Which, um... I'm getting bard vibes from it. And bard and um diplomancer. That's exactly right. Um so obviously the bard uh you know the ranger is one thing. Like the ranger has been reworked in, enough into the hunter that we call it like its own class. It's it's an original class cuz it essentially is the bard. Whew, bard's a full caster. You can't just like do a rework on that one. Mm-hmm. We had to come up with a new concept, and you know the concept's a pretty simple one. There's a, everybody knows that there are people out there that just are able to enrapture others with words um, or performance. You, you may have seen a singer on stage at at like a, a show, or um, like heard even a politician speak, or. Uh, it may have just been somebody at a party that you were at that was just like they're the person telling the stories mm-hmm. and everybody shuts up and just starts listening to them that is the person that is the persona of the wordsmith they are able to charm the pants off of almost anything although that's not necessarily their goal i don't want to make it sound too much like the bard so um no uh, we've we've art we we've had to su- i think we've all had to suffer through enough um bards who can't keep it in their pants as it is yeah. So like it's you start with somebody who just has a gift for a charismatic presentation and you with the wordsmith you choose as a subclass what direction you go with that, whether it's the political direction, you know, or and diplomatic direction or it's the entertainment direction. Are you, you know, a theater person um, or or an instrument player and you just have, you know, that singing voice that everybody just loves to hear mm-hmm. Um And there are a fair amount of spell-like abilities available to the wordsmith, more than I think are available to pretty much anybody anybody else. Because um, when you look at it, enchantment magic is is a lot of enchantment magic is very close to like real-world effects that can happen. And so the wordsmith has an ability called powerful words that lets them really kind of emulate spell-like effects on the people around them. Yeah. You know, how how else would charm still be a thing if people couldn't actually charm other people? It's a thing. Mm-hmm. There are absolutely charmers out there. There is one particular style of campaign I can't wait to see if people try once we start getting the materials out there, which is taking one of the 21 major settlements and one of the cultures in those settlements and having a wordsmith or wordsmiths try and change some aspect of the cultural practices or the government that's there. You could run a campaign levels one through 10 in one of these cities, trying to subvert the order of the hegemony or something. There's a lot of room for nuance in a way that we're hoping people who play red sky will get a expanded list of opportunities to be social and have these social interactions on top of the gameplay when combat comes in. Mm-hmm. Now, 
And I just realized I skipped. I skipped when I was as I was going down the list. I forgot to. I forgot to ask about emissary. Ooh, Ooh lad. Yeah, the emissary was. This was a long time uh, brainchild of mine, and like, because of course we we had uh, you know uh, one of the major classes that has been left out um, uh, is the paladin, and the paladin is a player favorite in fifth mm-hmm. edition. Because I mean, who doesn't love the the charismatic one that can smash stuff? It's it's awesome. Maybe it's just me, um, but my but whenever I think paladin, I always think of that. Pri- I always think of that priest from Dead Alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, the uh, so uh, you know, paladin also just a magical like being by nature of existence. Mm-hmm. Same with the cleric; they can't really exist in the function that they are. So that left a hole. Um, so uh, where the wordsmith is a charismatic individual that is using, utilizing their talents for um, themselves, ultimately, you know, even if they're a good person, they are trying to utilize the talents that they have in order to further their own ambitions and, you know, whether for the good of the other people or just because they're selfish. Um, the emissary believes entirely in a force organization or ideology external to themselves. Mm-hmm. Similar to how the paladin takes an oath, an oath of vengeance, an oath of the ancient ancients, um, or like even even in a way the druid, like the circle of the moon, like they they believe in um, a, in in a force outside of themselves, a higher calling that they are devoting their lives to following. So I had a particular vision in mind when I was uh, drafting the emissary, which is, you know, like a child growing up in a monastery, a church, um, in in a like a, a king's palace, and being trained by the people there mm-hmm. to in in the ways of self defense, um, and politicking, and um, you know survival skills, simply in order to go out into the world. Um, and spread or further the cause that is that they believe in. Uh, and that is the ultimate goal of the emissary. So what, what mechanically how they end up going is they are a very socially strong character, pro- probably the strongest of any class except for the wordsmith. Mm-hmm. Um, so they have strong social advantages. They're also a very defensive and charismatic leader in in combat. They are able to you bring out mechanical advantages by guiding, you know, um, the the other players and giving them benefits in combat in a very tactical way. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think one of their main abilities is uh, tactical mind, which is like you can um, spend resources in order to give your allies benefits in combat and. Uh, so yeah, that, that it's kind of the persona of the paladin, but not similar mechanically. Um, it's not going to smash and like divine smite something by itself. It's meant to fill a different kind of role. The way you're describing so, it, it it reminds me far more of one of the lost classes of um, of fourth edition, the warlord. Yeah. So I have never played fourth edition, but I heard a lot about the warlord. And um, it's the kind of thing that a lot of people complained about when it was left out of 5th edition. I do know that much. Mm-hmm. So, it is a character that I can't wait to put through the system for creation. Um, he will be an archivist, which is the species up in the cold parts of Dema that are obsessed with collecting Elder Tech. Mm-hmm. It's basically their religion. He is going to be an emissary on behalf of one of those city states. And just as I'm going to roleplay him, you could be like in the deepest part of the dungeon and two of the party get their hands on a piece of elder tech. He is not going to let go. He is bringing that back to the Athenaeum. And at this point, there are some interesting questions for, yeah, you know, we brought along Tyler's character for sound defensive tactics and planning. But we're going to have to figure out what to do now that he's pretty much going to hijack the entire <laughs> direction. Yeah, it's of the like, you can still use it as long as we're heading 
back to my homeland to <laughs> give it to my like you know my family you know that's that's what, what we're doing why am i being yeah, reminded, Indiana Jones. why am i being reminded of why am i being reminded of the um adeptus mechanicus from 40k <laughs> oh yes <laughs> They would, uh, the Mechanicus and the Archivists would have a very fond uh, shared pastime of putting things they don't understand in museums and fighting people for their right to. No, they wouldn't. They'd be fighting each other for who get for who gets dibs. <laughs> hey, come on, man. <laughs> but the last one, the last one on the list that I have is the Rogue and. When it comes to the rogue, I'm curious how I'm curious how once again with the fighter how similar and how different the rogue is from the vanilla rogue. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, uh, same with the fighter. There, there's we've had to come up with some stuff because you know, um, you know, you don't want it to be exactly the same as vanilla five E. Where's the mm -hmm. fun in that? But um, a lot of the uh, abilities of the rogue are duplicated and just reshuffled. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me take a look at uh, yeah I got my thing right hope um, open right here. They're like for example their sneak attack advances a little bit faster, not that much faster. Just like it's one level ahead of where it would be otherwise to be like you know as, as if the rogue need, needs the rogue needs more advantages. I know, uh, but it's um, they get an archetype feature uh, earlier um, the. Uh, their uncanny dodge uh, comes. Oh wait, no, uncanny dodge is the same. Right, reliable talent has been moved uh, from a from level eleven to level ten, um, and like so, it's a kind of a reshuffling of features. Mm -hmm. um, there are some. There's one new feature that we are experimenting with, but that is still in play testing, and I don't want to reveal it yet. But what I can talk about is the the subclass the con artist who is meant to be kind of wordsmithy but of course you're a jerk so <laughs> like a true jerk and just as similar as we've had um you know the uh you know the wordsmith who can become a bard and sing any like sing anybody to sleep or um you know the politician who can convince anybody of almost anything you know, one on one in a room. Uh, there, there is an intermediary between the wordsmith and the rogue thief, and that is the con artist. And they use their abilities of charm and deception. They bring, they give life to that concept that many rogues go down anyway. Um, I wanted to like kind of take the because I mean, who hasn't been in a rogue in a party with a rogue that has a plus like nine or something to their deception score? Mm -hmm. And so it's like it almost doesn't matter at that point what they roll; they're going to be able to lie to like anything. And and um, like there are mechanical uh, like the con artist brings some mechanical advantages to that kind of thing, mm -hmm. including um, let's see here. Um, yeah, right. So they can, um, uh, w when you take the tack of convincing something, somebody, uh, an NPC that an action will be to their benefit, you get advantage on like your per persuasion and your deception. Um, you also, um, gain proficiency with the disguise kit and the forgery kit because you are meant to be able to come up with fake scenarios, um, that to like, it's all about setting up. A particular NPC, you you have a mark, and you set yourself up to lie to them as effectively as you possibly can. And they're meant to be like nearly unstoppable if they have like you know if they're able to plan in advance, they're going to be able to get away with it. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm excited about the con artist. I think it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, yeah. Ken well, and I have a running joke about a spore spawn con artist. Uh, the spore spawn are a fungal hive mind that is shattered. So all of a sudden, hundreds of thousands of people woke up fully formed, wondering like, oh, this is weird. I'm a person. Mm -hmm. um, spore spawn can grow generations of different bioforms to do specific jobs. So we have spore spawn Jim, which is totally off from the series of consonants that is normally spore spawn language. Uh, but Jim is like, oh, my God, I'm awake. What is my purpose? And he looks down at his hands and they're lockpicks. And his uh, his grower says, "Yeah, you're gonna open doors." 
oh. sneak in the Rick and Morty joke because of course you have to. <laughs> At least, at least I'm not. At least it's a Rick and Morty joke that doesn't involve goddamn Szechuan sauce. Yeah. <laughs> when culture goes too far, tonight at eleven. Yeah. Um, now, next, I, w I wanted to ask about the social encounter system that you have because I've seen my fair share of of people make attempts or and inroads to try and emulate some aspect of of social. Of social encounters within, within art within RPGs to varying degrees of success, and I'm curious the approach that you guys are ta are taking with it. Well, I'm sure glad you asked, um, because uh, I'm sh like you. I have seen a fair number of attempts at social um, combat, and I have found over time, oh, like. They, they tend to be cumbersome. They tend to add too much or try to simulate combat in a way that just does not feel realistic. So the problem that I was having was that the social combat or social, like dealing with NPCs in vanilla 5e, it always felt like something was missing. Mm -hmm. um, but normally... When, when they are, you know, when you have a good GM and you're role-playing effectively, things still go rather well. Uh, you know, it's not like it doesn't make sense the way that you're playing it out, but, you know, uh, then you then take a turn as a GM and you go and you read, like, you know, the module that you're supposed to be running. Mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, this NPC has, they don't want to help the party, but, you know, they have this thing that the party needs. And that's it. That's all that they tell you. So it's like, so what it boils down to is like you have to make a charisma check, a persuasion check against this NPC. And that, that's the end of the rope. That's that's all you have to do. And like if you're a good GM, you'll come up with a personality for them. Or maybe there's some kind of personality in the prose of the book that you can that you can pull on. Mm -hmm. um, but anything more complicated than that is usually not really it's left to the gm's devices if you want to extend ex extend the social encounter you have to do it yourself and hem and haw your way into oh that persuasion check was good so now there's this reason and now this persuasion check is also good so now there's this reason and that one failed but i don't want to throw you out of my my tavern yet mm -hmm. so i'll give you another chance you know and it will end up expanding like that so um as a gm for a while i noticed that this was a natural pattern you know um, and also as a GM for a while, I know that even when you have experience, it can kind of be hard to on the fly swap into an like NPCs um, and become their personality. Um, it's especially if you're doing multiple NPCs in one session or, you know, please forbid it in, in like one conversation, you're playing multiple NPCs. Mm -hmm. I'm not the best voice actor. That's always a challenge for me. So, um, what we're trying to do with the social encounter system in Red Sky is not add cumbersome mechanics to the game, but we want to take that natural process of this person has these things and their personality is like this. The party wants this. Mm -hmm. And here's how they feel about the party. That's one aspect of it. And then here's how resistant they would be to what the party wants to do. And here's how tolerant they are of failure. Those are like the concepts. What they want, what they have, how many chances they give the NPCs and how much failure they tolerate. That's what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. And the way that it ends up playing out is it's just kind of a way to codify those notes into a stat block so that you can easily write it down, plan it, and hand it off to other GMs if you need to, and reference it while you're running games. Um, that is paired together with a system that's similar to the death saving throw system mm -hmm. in 5th edition, where you know you go down and you're trying to roll dice to see whether you die, mm -hmm. except those successes and failures are tied to the charisma or other skill um, checks and failures that you have made and how many you need changes depending on what you're asking and how much the person you're talking to hates you. Mm -hmm. So 
it's not meant we're not adding some unnecessary like tumor onto fifth edition because a lot of people roll with the charisma checks and it works fine they just wish there was something a little bit longer and gms wish that there was a little bit easier time they had an easier time planning npcs Mm -hmm. we wanted to take those problems and just fix them using the systems that already exist in fifth edition all right that is I know that was a bit long-winded, but that's that's my summary of it. So I, fi- I, I honestly figured that tackling something like this was going to be long-winded simply because of the simply because of one, the baggage of trying to do social encounters, and two, this is effectively a, a whole new subsystem within the sandbox. There's no there's no way yeah. to really summarize that in a paragraph. Yeah. We to want... borrow a completely egregious Warhammer reference, uh, social encounters in 5e were space marines. Brandon has created Primaris marines. The ingredients are all there, but it's uh, taller, like you. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> I feel it's attacked. Like you... <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> it, we it, wanted Primaris. If you wanted to plan a dungeon, you know that this NPC is going to be in this room and you know it's going to be a non-combat encounter or it's probably going to be a non-combat encounter unless the players are murder hobos. Um, <laughs> so, um, why isn't there a stat block for that? Mm-hmm. Why isn't there a block of text that is, yes, here is how they will react to these different approaches. This is how they feel about the party. And this is how much they'll need to work to convince this NPC of this thing for it to work. It, like, that is just not fair. And, like, I want to be able to look at a page and not have to read through three paragraphs of prose in order to, like, understand an NPC's motivations. That's the yeah. problem that we're trying to solve. The ongoing Solar Studio saga of trying to refine game mechanics so that as the, like, experience of DMing or playing a campaign is just smoother streamlined in a way that is enjoyable because you have less to worry about and, like, and for, the re- for the record some players and some games they like just completely play acting conversations like just gm and players just talking it out and they don't even roll much this isn't really gonna be for them you know mm-hmm. like it it some people really enjoy that and that's fine like you know i'm glad that you know you're able to work that well i'm not a great voice actor i'm not a great actor in in particular i know that this will help me and i don't i think i'm not the only one out there that would benefit from from having a little bit more structure to these these encounters Mm. yeah and if you want to make a custom like dialogue heavy encounter you can always just use the existing 5e rules that we're running on to you know craft whatever custom scenario you want to play through it's yeah. your campaign mm-hmm. now gi- given all given all of that what are you guys shooting for as far as a page count i know that um stretch goals might um bo- might end up boosting the total in that regard mm-hmm. um yes so uh i will be a little bit candid with you on the call here this isn't actually in the story yet um but we one of our stretch goals is in fact expanding the page count by 50 percent um which we really want to do uh currently as it stands we can afford to make and ship a a book that is 200 pages i'm anticipating it being about 215 225 Mm -hmm. um and the the um spread is going to be uh, between 80 and 110 pages of mechanics and the rest of it is going to be like entirely lore so uh it's going to be a tight fit um if we do get that page expansion we are going to have maybe a few more pages of mechanics but it's going to be essentially double the lore Mm -hmm. because the thing the thing that we are that that we've had to make cuts to is the amount of lore we have we have way more than we are able to fit into this book so in a very exciting way there's yeah. there's going to be enough tools as far as cultural practices and histories and what societies exist at each location that you know any dot on the map is nuanced enough for a dm to have an entire campaign in mm-hmm. and what what would you guys be shooting for as far as a release window 
Not a release date, per se, but a release window for the PDF version. Oh, well, the core rules, um, I am shooting to, we are shooting to release around January of next year. That it would be without the lore write-up and without the art. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give us an extra buffer of time in order to make sure that the layout is great, um, you know, and as good as we can possibly make it. Uh, we anticipate the PDF to be done uh, like the digital of mm -hmm. the full digital version with all the layout, the lore and everything to be done in April um, or actually in March of 2022. And we want to have the books delivered to people by April of 2022. Mm -hmm. So, you know, g give or take maybe a month. You know, I I'm fairly certain we'll be able to hold to that deadline. Uh, yeah. So and at the rate time seems to be passing in 2021. It's it's around the corner. Yeah. Yeah. At the ver at the very le at the very least, if when at the very least, if it's sho if if it's showing up if it's showing up in March, then hey, I have an, I have an excuse I have an excuse to st I have an excuse to stay away from everybody pretending to be Irish for a week. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually reading the book. <laughs> uh, but the the other thing the other um the other thing that I that I was curious about is the not is the um is the novelization which on certain tiers you get early access to um and the obvious question that i have to ask is which came first the chicken or the egg oh man so basically something slightly genetically different than a chicken laid the novel egg <laughs> um when alex came to me in college and said hey would you want to build this universe for these game ideas i have it was definitely influenced by all of the storytelling and you know the canon of science fiction and fantasy that mm -hmm. had come to it um red sky is designed to be a creative space is one of its main features so as we were building out this world i was already getting ideas for a character or characters that could be strong presences in the canon, but would be able to interact with in a novel. It's 86,000 words as of right now. It has mm -hmm. gone through enough revision that I think, as far as early access goes, it is probably one of the best ways you could dive into the lore and what really has the DNA of Red Sky. So... Yeah, chicken or the egg, I mean, it's almost as if, like, the chicken was born pregnant. <laughs> like, you know, the novel was always an idea. I, get, I gotcha. And I'm get, um, get, since it mentions um, early access to that, I'm guessing that the Red Sky cycle is going to be a far more long-term aff affair than the um, conversion book itself. So the weird thing about the pandemic is I discovered a burst of productivity uh, that I didn't think I had in me. The trilogy of books that will be the Red Sky Cycle is already well into development. The first one is functionally completed and waiting for an editor. The second one is very firmly past the halfway point of being drafted. So regardless of how this would be published officially, anyone who is interested in seeing these stories is going to get the first book at whatever pledge tier they back at and probably will have the words in front of their eyes by like this time next year, mm -hmm. as far as the second book goes. So I want to have enough texture for people to dive into it without having to think of like unfinished trilogies the same way. Uh, oh no, the one, I mean, there's, there's multiple fantasy authors who don't never finish. <laughs> um, yeah, don't, don't, don't call out names. That's just yeah. me. <laughs> no. And I, I basically, no, I, I want to be you. <laughs> I want to be can. able to respect the expectations of this story has a beginning, middle, and the end, and you're going to get it soon. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how the how the whole thing um, how the whole thing turns out and sh and shakes out. And I do want to offer my congratulations on you guys managing to get over twice your initial goal, because at the time of this recording, it's at twenty eight thousand and change just under twenty nine thousand with twenty one days to go. Yeah. It is and, unreal. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're still pulling for it. We're gonna keep pushing because we wanna make sure that we deliver the best book we can possibly get to everybody. Yeah. Just now even that we know 
yeah, now that we yeah. know there's a demand, we're like, all right, crack knuckles, let's do this. Yeah. Bringing this world to life has been amazing for all of us. Mm -hmm. And with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come up to the temple and brave the hell of time zones to enjoy the madness here. <laughs> and it's yeah, been, it's been a great trip to the temple. Mm -hmm. And yeah, any... Mildred, it sounds like there's such an overlap in just the general taste of the stuff that you and your viewers and listeners enjoy. We're hoping that Red Sky could just be one more deep dive into the kind of like storytelling everybody here grew up loving. Mm -hmm. And of course, anytime you see fit to return to the temple, whether it's to further dive into into Red Sky once once I have more access to the lo more access to the lore. Or, or just to shit post about how the bard keeps getting himself killed. Um, <laughs> the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Next time I will have a stout. Mm -hmm. A stout stout for the evening. All right. Yeah, let's do it. Shoot on a Friday night. I would love that. <laughs> it's Friday. <laughs> I have to deal with. Uh, I have to deal with half a dozen time zones. It's Friday somewhere. <laughs> All right, I guess that's it, right? Oh, but but of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>